so I was saying just before the adjournment that um, when Lord Wilson returns to the concept in NREF of reasonable reliance, he immediately refers to the importance of independent inquiry. And that's paragraph 23, and he goes to Caparo. So if we just go ourselves quickly to Caparo, I, I know that it's all very familiar, but just to pick out a couple of things, which is an authorities to chapter 13. And we go to page 361. Let's, let, let's just pick up the paragraph. And then a friend relied on the show that merges there too. It's at 343. Bottom there. This is Lord Bridge. But he says the yeah. salient feature of all these cases. And then it's over the. Well, it's, unfortunately, the sentence runs over the page. But knew that the advice or information would be communicated directly or indirectly. And knew that it was very likely the plaintiff would rely on that. So that's the bit that's quoted by uh, Lord Wilson. In yeah. And then we go on to page 361 of the bundle, where Lord Oliver is famously distilling what can be deduced from Henry Burton. And he starts on page 361 of the bundle at letter C. Uh, and he, he says, where the advice is required for a purpose, the advisor knows, actually or inferentially, that his advice will be communicated to the advisee, either specifically or as a member of the class, in order that it should be used by the advisee for that purpose. Now, that's important, and I'll come back to that. I'm going to round up these purpose points with, with the Playboy case, because that's where it all comes together. But just note that for now. <coughs> Three, known either actually or inferentially that the per advice so communicated is likely to be acted on by the advisee for that purpose without independent inquiry. So that is his specific, one of the specific points he gets from Henry Byrne. He's quite right, and, and it's picked up by the Supreme Court again in Enra. And there's just one more part to show you this um, from Lord Jauncey, page 384. Do we get anything from Henry Byrne itself that casts light on independent inquiry? There's one. Uh, um, oh, cool. no! I mean, don't you know? Yeah. If you don't know the answer, uh, don't don't hazard a guess because it, they're, they're quite dense judgments. I had yeah. a quick look at um, there was a passage from Lord Morris's um, speech that was relied on. I think I, I'm going to have to come back to you on that. I'm sorry. I should I should be able just no, to right. answer that. I can't. Don't worry. So are you going to show us Lord Jauncey? Yes, Lord Jauncey at page 384. Uh, and, and he's... The, the quotation's at the top from the Court of Appeal judgment. Uh, and he says, at, at, at letter C, in my view, these observations go too far. The possibility of reliance on a statement for an unspecified purpose will not impose a duty of care. More is required. In Smith and Eric S. Bush, it was probable if not highly probable, that the potential purchaser would rely on the value of the report. This probable reliance was an essential ingredient in establishing proximity. Obviously, he's talking proximity terms rather than assumption of responsibility terms. Uh, had it merely been a possibility that the purchaser would rely on the report, I very much doubt whether this house would have decided the value owed a duty of care. Yeah. So he, too, is stressing the um, Lord Bridge very likely, uh, Lord John C. probable. So, that's Caparo. Could, and could, it also gained purpose. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I put it away. Yeah. Yes, exactly so. Thank you. I'm grateful. Uh, and, and of course, that, that flows from um, some of the bits of, of Lord Jaunty's own speech in, in Eric S. Bush, which is, is quoted earlier. I mean, now you point that out. If we go back to 364. Quoting Smith and Eric S. Bush. Yeah. He's talking about independent, <coughs> independent um, assessment by value. And he says, uh, in, he says in, in at C, in Headley Byrne, the provider of the information was the obvious and most easily available, if not the only available source of the information. It would be difficult, therefore, to conclude that the person who sought it was likely to rely on it. In the case of an intending mortgage, the position is very different. Since financial considerations are partners likely to be available from a wide choice, choice of sources of information with independent values to whom they can resort. I'm going to come on to that because um, that's important. And the judge has specifically found 
There are all sorts of skilled tax advisors out there to whom investors could have could have resorted, and, and we'll look at some of those. And then he, he links that with value. Uh, I would not conclude the mere fact that mortgages value and those his valuation will be shown of itself imposed on the duty of care. Knowledge actually implied that the likely reliance on the valuation must be brought home to him. Uh, and that's fair at the lower end of the market, that known concept that such a really implication would arise in the case of quite an expensive property, whether residential or commercial. And, and, and all that has resonance here. Because if you're sticking hundreds of thousands, some of the millions of quid into a tax avoidance scheme, really implication does not follow. Now, if we stay in the same bundle and go on to tab 20, please. This is the BCCI case, which I referred to earlier. And I'm, I'm misled by Lady, Lady Justice Carver, which I apologize. I think I said that this is a buy-sell case, but it's not. It's a, it's a duty of care case. Um, not in a buy-sell transaction. The, the, the basic point, it's a strikeout case in which the facts don't really matter. But essentially, um, Ernst and Winnie, which takes one back a bit, uh, were being, <coughs> was trying to strike out allegations of negligence which were being made by a group company. They, they hadn't audited. And they said they didn't owe a duty of care to an entity that was not their client. And, and so that issue arose for arguability purposes. Yeah. And, and what's important here is paragraph 720 which starts at page 568. And this is a well-known checklist. It's often cited in the cases. Both my learned friend and I have cited it in our skeletons. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very useful guide. It's a distilled version of his McNaughton checklist. <clears throat> and all these four, he makes five points, uh, and they're all valuable. Uh, but in particular, for <coughs> present purposes, which is independent inquiry, I want to draw your attention to letter D at 569. So this is one of the factors, the presence or absence of other advisors on whom the advisee would or could rely. This factor is analogous to the likelihood of intermediate examination of product liability cases. So it just undermines the proposition you're going to have independent inquiry, that it's reasonable simply to rely. And just while we're there, I just want to pick up a couple of other points from the chapters to save me coming back to them. At, at the top of the page is his his first one about the relationship between advisor and advisee, and he accepts the submission that there may be an important difference between the cases where the advisor and advisee are dealing at arm's length and cases when they're on the same side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And that's an important context. And he then actually links that point together with the point D about interdependent inquiry, which we just looked at over the page at 8.3. Page 570 of the bundle, paragraph 8.3. And he just observes, in cases where the parties are dealing at arm's length, that's his point A, the court is likely to be slow to extend the orbit of the duty of care to include persons other than the intermediate client, just as in peach publishing. You don't just rely on the other person's advisor. There is a barrier which has to be overcome. And this barrier will be strengthened or even duplicated if a third party is in receipt of independent advice. So he, he links those two points together in, in that way. So slow to extend the orbit, strengthening factor. And it, he says, in receipt of independent advice, but I would translate that in NRAM terms to reasonably to be expected to be in receipt of, of independent advice, because that's what matters. It's not whether you actually take it or not. That's after the event. It's whether you are reasonably to be expected to take independent advice. And then if we just go back to 569 mm. and look at point C, the precise circumstances in which the information, advice or information was communicated, for what purpose or purposes, uh, it will be necessary to consider the purpose or purposes of the communication, both as seen by the advisor and as seen by the advisor and the degree of reliance which the advisor intended or should reasonably have anticipated would be placed on its accuracy uh, and the reliance in fact placed. Now, that point about purpose and intention chimes with the point I asked you to note in Caparo as we were going through. Uh, and as I say, these, this concept has been picked up by the Supreme Court in Playboy, and, and that's where I'm going to deal with it. But again, you know, red pen by that bit, because purpose and intention which I, th I think is objective rather than subjective attention, are, are 
report. Of I know uh, BCCI was cited in NRAM, um, but was it referred to in, in any of the opinions? I don't think it is. I, I, I couldn't swear. But well, say, we know it was referred I, didn't, to I, didn't, I hadn't actually noticed no, that it was cited. It is. Yeah, it was cited. Right. So Lord, Lord Justice Neil has a misfortune of having to write two rather good checklists. Yeah. And so, sometimes <laughs> one gets cited, sometimes the other, but never both. The, so could, could, could I take you next, please, to McCulloch and Lane Fox, still in the same bundle, at tab 17. And, and we just look at the head neck just to, to ground ourselves. Uh, and the key thing to appreciate here is that the chronology of events over a weekend. The, on a viewing of a house on a Saturday morning. There's an oral representation by the estate agent, which you can see is a letter to me, that the site was 0.92 on an acre. And after that oral representation, they handed over the particulars, which had a, a broad disclaimer, as it says, a, a letter E. And just for your note, the claimant never relied on the written particulars, which contained the same misrepresentation. They also said 0.92 of an acre, but they didn't sue on the particulars because of the disclaimer. They were trying to get round it by suing only on the oral misrepresentation. That was, that was the, the ingenious thought in the case. Uh, and then there's an offer on the Saturday night, and then on the Sunday there's a second viewing and an increased offer, and then they exchange it on the Monday, so it's a hot time in the market. Uh, and and Mr. you can see at the bottom, Mr. Justice Coleman, who was the trial judge, Held that there was a duty. He held that the disclaimers didn't specifically refer to oral misrepresentations, so they didn't apply as a matter of construction. But he said that the property was worth what the paper anyway, so no damages. Um, he was then reversed on literally every single one of those points. <laughs> but the, the one which matters for present purposes is duty. And if we're still in the head note over the page of 468, you, you can see that all. Three of the Lord Justices agreed that there was no duty, that there was a division of opinion as the right route to that. But the division of opinion was essentially over whether, when you've made a negligent mis oral misrepresentation, the agent then owed a subsequent duty to correct what had been said. And uh, Lord Justice Slade and Lord Justice North said no, and Lord Justice Hobhouse said yes. But for present purposes, what matters to me is that they were something they were all agreed on, which is the importance in principle of whether the buyer was going to have his own survey. Was he going to have an intermediate inspection? Was he going to make independent inquiry? And if we start with Lord Justice Slade, at page 503 of the book, I'm sorry, by then he was Sir Christopher Slade, but um, let me on. Uh, Page five, 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 zero, three. Five, zero, three. Five, zero, three, sorry. Yeah, it's, it inaccurately described it at the beginning of the report as Lord Justice Hobhouse and Norse and Mr. Justice Slade. It's actually Sir Christopher, Sir Christopher Slade, Slade after he retired. Called appeal judge. Exactly. Yes. That's, that's the this professional is negligence of the report, isn't it? Sir? I'm sorry, my lord. You've been in the Court of Appeal long before that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, it, it does strike one as odd when you see that. Um, Archaeology. <laughs> so you see at 5A3, uh, the, uh, uh, just below D, so the statement of claim asserted the duty of care owed uh, and was broken on the first visit. And then he says, that submission, however, gave rise to difficulties which were appreciated by the judge. I believe that one of the salient features of all the cases in which, in the absence of a contractual relationship between representor and representee, a representation has been held to give rise to a breach of the duty of caring tort, is that the defendant has known, actually or inferentially, that it was likely that the plaintiff would rely on the representation without further independent inquiry. See Capare. So fair and square, 
you're just a slave. Yeah. Uh, Sir so, so Christopher. So yeah. Make, makes, makes the point of the importance. Uh, over the page, uh, he then discusses whether that changed when they should have realized that it wasn't going to be a survey. I mean, but what, what he says is that, it, it, I'm so sorry, at the bottom of 503, I shouldn't have gone over the page. Uh, so Mr. Joseph Coleman was right. You don't owe a duty, or the agent didn't owe a duty, because, if only because, at that time, he would have been entitled reasonably to take the view that his statement would be independently checked and would not be relied upon. So that's the power of independent inquiry. And over the page, he then does talk about whether that could withstand the fact that he knew he wouldn't have a survey and that, that, that doesn't matter for our purposes. So 505, Lord Justice Knowles agrees with Sir Christopher, uh, but says it doesn't matter because the disclaimers put it beyond doubt. And then Lord Justice Hobhouse approached it in the same way in principle, he just took a different view of the facts. But if we go back to page 496 of the bundle, Two, three, four of the report. The structure of the transaction, and there's an argument set out by the claimants, which you can see the conclusion of is at the bottom of that paragraph, uh, which is quite similar to my learned friend's point. It's foreseeable the representation may be relied on because it's intended to have the effect of influencing the prospective purchaser to buy. The defendants counter this conclusion with an argument which can be advanced both as a matter of principle and by reference to the facts of this case. And then he deals with the principle. It says in the law of negligence, the concept of proximity, which of course everybody was thinking Sorry, of. I'm lost. Where are you, Pitch? Uh, so I was at the bottom of 496. I started reading there and then just turned the page, turn the page reading that saying 497. Advanced both as a matter of principle and by reference to the facts of the case. It, it, it got it. In the law of negligence, the concept of proximity is inconsistent with the contemplation or expectation of an intermediate check. And he goes back to Donna Hume Stevenson. Uh, and, and then concludes, thus, in product liability cases, the likelihood there will be an intermediate inspection or check negatives the existence of the duty of care. And then he moves on to transactions in land and talks about the usual, there's usually a survey and then says at C, thus it does not follow that a representation, although intended to influence the representee, will be relied upon in the relevant way without an intermediate. And then he took a different view, as I said, on, on the facts of the case. Um, we see it also in echoes of Mr. Stewart's approach. Um, if one looks at the head note, page 468, letter C to D, you know, the question being, is the disclaimer of a disclaimer, <coughs> or here, whatever, warnings or um, indications that there should be separate advice, was a fact to be taken into consideration in determining whether there had been an assumption of responsibility. Yes, that, that becomes... It's sufficient to negative, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a factor. Yeah, that becomes particularly important in relation to UCTA. Yeah. And that's... Um, there, is a, there is a fiendishly complicated point under UCTA. I look forward to that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I, may, I may just tell you it's my tertiary line and not go to it. I think, I think I've got to go into it. But that's, that's where that comes in. So we can put the colour away. Uh, and that, uh, and just, just kind of summarising, just say it, the, those four cases show that it is clearly established as a general principle that when you're trying to assess the, the tortious duty of care across the line, in NRAN terms, the reasonableness of reliance and the foreseeability of reliance, it's the anticipation of an advisor on the claimant's own side of the fence who can check whatever it is that needs to be checked. So it was acreage in McCulloch. It was accounts in Peach Publishing. It's tax in this case. So in, in, in fact, in, in, in my learned friend's new authority from last week, new elderly authority, it's cars. So let's have a quick look at the good little bus. Uh, tab, tab four in authorities bundle one. And I'm not going to show you anything other than two passages which are at page 72 and page 74. At page 72, Mr. Justice McNair states the facts and, uh, and then continued, and it's point six, the defendant had no reason to anticipate that the plaintiff would himself have the car examined by a competent mechanic before taking it on the road. 
he would himself examine it. And then page 74. About three quarters of the way down, do you see, the, do you see Donahue and Stevenson, which leaps out of the page? Mm -hmm. is it? Yeah. The, the judge, after an elaborate review of the authorities, including the following Donahue and Stevenson, further held the test of liability in such a case depended on whether or not it could reasonably be anticipated that the car would be examined by the party taking it or other third party before being put on the road, not whether such examination was possible. So uh, that rather makes the point for me again. Uh, it's like Lord Justice Hophouse said, it's product liability cases. If there's going to be an intermediate inspection, that's an obstacle to duty. And insofar as Andrews yeah. and Hopkinson is of any value at all, which frankly it isn't, it, it actually supports that, that proposition. But I, none of these cases about in that, when you get down to their specifics, you've got to be looking for the general principle, are of any real use. Because as soon as you overlay onto them the fact of another case or the fact of this case, everything completely changes. So if you imagine in Andrews and Hopkinson that the, 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 the garage, the, the seller of the car, had said, look, I've had a mechanic inspect it. He says it's fine, but you should get your own mechanic. And, and then imagine that in order to buy it, the, 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 the buyer had had to sign documents saying, yes, I understand that I've got to have my own mechanic and I have taken my own yeah. mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. You the Hexel Hertel, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Hertel case that the judge that's referred to uh, by Mrs. Justice McNair there is actually one of the cases that all Justice Hobhouse has referred to. Yes, yes it was. Hazel yes. and Dorr was the other one. Yeah. The where where you where the, the there's going to be an intermediate inspection that negatives the, exactly. the existence of the duty of care. Exactly so. In in a non contractual scenario. Yes, it's a non contractual <clears throat> position. Obviously, if you contract to, uh, if the representation is a contractual one, there is no answer. Absolutely. And, and that was what was going on in Peach. Uh, they, they wanted a warranty. They wanted the seller to warrant the accounts. Mm -hmm. That's what they were really after. And you know, as I said, there's no way Scots are warranting the outcome of this tax scheme because the, the, then they just become sitting ducks. Actually, the, the same point arises out in, in Candle and Crane. I, I haven't brought. I haven't, I'm not, there's so much authority in the bundle already, I've not brought it along. I'm just going to read out to you the page because I, I just noticed it this morning. But because it too offers support for the intermediate inspection uh, point. And when, if you want to look it up later, we may well take the view, you don't need to. It's at page 181 of the King's Bench Division Reports. But having, after the passage on which my learned friend relies, immediately after that, uh, Lord Justice Denning refers to the decision in the Libra and Gould. Uh, which is summarised in this way. So the mortgagee said that the uh, owner's surveyor, so the mortgagee said somebody else's advisor owed a duty of care to them. That was obviously untenable, says Lord Justice Denning, because they should have had the work surveyed by their own surveyor. Indeed, they'd actually stipulated for that. The relationship was therefore one in which the inspection of an intermediate person might reasonably be interposed and was consequently too remote to raise a duty of care. See Donahue and Stevenson. So, you know, all these cases speak with one voice. It's a very, very important factor. Now, the, the, the last authority I want to refer to in the general principle is the Playboy decision. And that we find, it does offer a useful further insight, and it is at Authorities 5, Bungle 5, tab 30. Sorry, while we're digging that out, I've just made a note. You said intermediate advice is a very important factor. Um, so, is that how you put it, or do you say that reliance in NREM terms means reliance without independent inquiry? Is there a difference? It, I, the way I put it is the bedrock is reasonable reliance. That's that, I think that's the bedrock, but you know, the next stratum up, if you, when you are assessing the reasonableness of reliance, is independent inquiry. And that, 
that's the intellectually honest answer. I'm not going to try to blend it in. I, I, it seems to me that the way the cases have developed, now that we all see, it's reasonableness of reliance. So you mean that when you're assessing reasonableness, um, if, if, if you're supposed to be making your own independent inquiry, it's going to be very difficult to establish uh, yeah. reasonableness? I mean, I, I would... Look, it's all, it's all facts, but I would say almost impossible. Because once you have said... It negatives it, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. It I just negatives. It goes back to your, in a sense, your point this morning about never say never. Yeah. But um, the fact is that it, it's unlike in the in, in unlike when one's examining <coughs> whether on the facts there has been reliance mm. on the assumption there is a duty. Then the fact that you may have relied on somebody else's advice as well. That's fine. Won't, won't mean that you can't have relied on the on on the um, the defendant's advice. Exactly. So. It may go to issues of contrib and so forth. Yeah. But it doesn't negatise the existence Quite. of the duty. Yeah. Like that. But when you come to look at whether there was a duty at all, and you think about was the was there reasonable reliance? Was it objectively reasonable to rely? And you then I, I would say it's actually a mandatory part of that inquiry on the cases. Okay. Well, what about independent inquiry? Was that reasonably mm -hmm. expected? Mm -hmm. Was that reasonably anticipated? And if the answer to that is yes, it was reasonably expected that there would be independent inquiry, that almost answers the question. And the, I only say almost because of never say never, and the, the common law always surprises one. Uh, and one should never try to lay down a general rule. But since you, you must do this inquiry as part of the reasonableness debate. And if it's answered in the way, it's just it must be answered in this case, but if it's ever answered to say, yes, there was a reasonable expectation that somebody else on that side of the fence will be looking at the same area, that's pretty much it. Now, Playboy, um, if we just look at the head note at 1290. So what had happened here was a, a very close relation to Hedley Byrne because a bank had supplied a negligent credit reference. The, the difference was that unlike in Hedley Byrne, instead of supplying it directly to the person who's going to rely on the credit reference, it went through an intermediary. And the bank that gave the reference didn't know that the person to whom they were giving the reference was just an intermediary. Now, I understand that there's a sound commercial reason for this structure, because the casino has learned apparently from experience that some of its customers do not welcome their bank managers being rung up and asked if they'll give a credit reference for use in the Playboy Club. But whatever the merits of the reason for concealing the identity... Yeah, Someone for its evidence. <laughs> the <laughs> Uh, the end result. I think that's a revenge for your comment uh, no, uh, this morning. Uh, I have to take that one before you too. Um, the end result here was that the, the, the entity that had relied on the credit reference and had suffered the loss was not the entity to which the credit reference had been given. And so right. the bank denied a duty of care. And, and the case largely turned on that issue, whether the defendant has to know the identity of the person who's going to rely on the relevant statement. And, and that's not an issue here. I'm not taking a point about potential investors being unknown as a class. But the, the analysis of the question contains a really interesting insight into Hedley Van liability more generally. So if you just stay, stay in the headache for a moment, if you just look down at, at the bottom of 1295, letter A, it's a rather impenetrable headache. But it's the bit that starts that ordinarily where, just above H, do you see that? Ordinarily, where a statement was relied upon by B, to whom A passed it on, the representor owed no duty to B unless he knew that it was likely to be communicated to and relied on by B. And it had to be part of the statement's known purpose that it should be communicated to and relied on by B if the representor were to be taken to assume responsibility. And it's that second part, that a, a point about purpose, that I want to draw to your attention. So just Setting it very quickly, uh, paragraph 6 
sets out as his Lord Assumption. Uh, he, he sets out Hedley Byrne. Uh, at, at seven, he says the principle thus established is capable of development and has had considerable development, for example, to cover commissions and the negative performance of services. These have been incremental changes within a consistent framework of principle. And one area in which the courts have resisted expanding the scope of liability is since the personal category of persons can be his own. Uh, then, uh, and, and he cites NRAM with approval there. So it's, it's all been looked at recently by this court in NRAM. Uh, and NRAM is the current last word. As well. And then he moves on. If we go to paragraph 11, this is the key, key paragraph. Well, it's the key page. At the top of it, he quotes that passage I showed you earlier from Lord Oliver in Caparo, which includes the reference to purpose in order that it should be used by the advisee for that purpose. And then at 11, uh, he, he, he says, well, first, the representative has got to know that the statement is going to be communicated. Uh, that's a concession by counsel, which he says is, is plainly justified. And then he says, uh, just above G, I would go further and say the representative must not only know that the statement is likely to be communicated to and relied on by B. It must also be part of the statement's known purpose that it should be communicated and relied on by B if the representative is to be taken to assume responsibility. So, in other words, what the Supreme Court was saying here is that there is a purposive element to the reasonable reliance criterion. The maker of the statement has got to have an intention, objectively assessed, in making it that the recipient is going to rely on it. And, and obviously, I do not mean subjective purpose. It's an objective assessment. But this is, I, I would suggest, quite a useful, just it's another angle of looking at the same question. That it's another way of looking at the NRAM reliance criteria. And it's worth noting that both Baroness Hale and Lord Reed were part of the court of both NRAM and Playboy. And they were handed down within, within months of each other. So NRAM says, Reliance has got to be reasonable and has got to be reasonably foreseeable to the representor. And, Playboy, and, and NRAM itself points to independent inquiry on that. But Playboy says, look, there's another way of looking at this as well, which is to look at the representation in the context of the transaction that it was made and make an objective assessment about what those involved should have known about the purpose. Why is it being sent over? Does it look as though, objectively, the representees were intended to be able to rely on it? Should the representor have appreciated that the representees were being intended to rely on it? Now, th this isn't actually a new idea. Uh, it's in Caporo. Um, it's in BCCI, as I showed you. But it, it is neatly expressed here. And the idea of a known purpose within the transaction is, is I would suggest, quite a useful addition to the conceptual armory in, in this area. And we can put Playboy away and just look at the last, very last authority before I turn to the specifics, which is a decision of Mr. <coughs> Hamden, as he then was in San Marino Bank. That's Authorities 327. Turn to page 774. And can I genuinely apologise for the amount of sidelining that's taking place in this authority? There was something went wrong somewhere in communications and electronics, and huge swathes of it have been sidelined. And I only want two paragraphs. So I'm very apologetic. I see my lady, Lady Justice, and I'm thinking, why did I read all that very stuff? Very puzzled. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, it, 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 something went badly wrong. Anyway, uh, it's paragraph 222 is the first paragraph. And, and here, this is in the passage where Ms. Justice Hamden is setting out general propositions about representation. And my point here is that this, this known purpose criteria we've just looked at actually 
makes a coherent overall approach because it makes it consistent with the general law relating to representations. And here he encapsulates this proposition. It is necessary for the statement relied on to have the character of a statement upon which the representee was intended and entitled to rely. Now that is playboy known purpose in the, the context of the law of representation generally. Uh, and then he says, the statement in question may have been accompanied by other statements by way of qualification or explanation, which would indicate that a reasonable person that the putative representor was not assuming a responsibility for the accuracy and completeness of the statement or saying no reliance can be placed upon it. Thus, the representor might qualify what might otherwise have been an outright statement of fact by saying it's only a statement of belief, but it may not be accurate, but he has not verified its accuracy or completeness or is not to be relied on. So there are all ways in which you can qualify <clears throat> the statement that you're making, uh, and that is uh, an important point, as we will see in the documents. The, the only other paragraph I wanted to draw to your attention very briefly uh, is at page 778, and I'll just do it while I'm here. Yep. Mm, it's 236 sub 2. Obviously, it's a completely different context. This is a um, financial uh, markets deal. It, 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 he's talking about qualifications and disclaimers of the, the nature he's just described generally in 222. He says, the essential principle underlying these qualifications and disclaimers is one of caveat energy. The buyer is meant to make his own assessment of the risk of the transaction and make an independent decision as to whether to enter into it. Um, and we say amen to that. It is just a useful reminder what underlies the giving of these notices, these qualifying statements, what underlies them is caveat emptor. It's perfectly reasonable in an arm's length transaction to make it clear the length of the arm, if I may put it in that way. Now, that's uh, my survey of the general principles. And I'm now going to move on to the specifics of the case. But before I do, I'm going to draw those threads together in what I hope is a traditional five points. One, the general rule is that A's lawyer knows, owes no duty of any sort to B. At the most basic level, that is because he has not agreed to do anything for B, which could attract the core obligation, which is competent performance. That's Ashraf. Point two. Like every general rule, this has got exceptions. Lord Justice Nuji helpfully categorised them into three. One of them, it's common ground, has no relevance. That's White and James. al Kandari, I've dealt with. If my learned friend relies upon it, it doesn't work for him because there's no. it relies upon being in a neutral role. The relevant exception here is the third one, which is where A's lawyer has made representations to B. Point three. Cases of that nature are governed by the in-ram principles. That means first, assumption of responsibility is key. Second, assumption of responsibility is assessed by the twin inquiry. And three, uh, it's particularly relevant in a claim against the counterparty's lawyer to focus on reasonableness of reliance. Because, and this is from paragraph 32, which we didn't look at, but it is, quote, presumptively inappropriate, unquote presumptively inappropriate for anyone to rely on something which is said by the counterparty's lawyer. Point four, it is central to the twin NRAM reasonableness inquiries to consider both whether the parties were at arm's length and also whether the representor could reasonably consider that the representee would make independent inquiries into what they're being told. And that goes to the reasonableness of anticipation of assessment of the representation on the other side of the fence. And that's a barrier to duty, if so. It negatives duty. And that is Caparo, it's McNaughton, it's BCCI, it's Peach, it's McCulloch, it's actually also Hopkinson and Kandler Crank. And then fifth and finally, you have to look at the objective intention set within the transaction behind the representation. That's Playboy, Caparo, BCCI, San Marino Bank. Is it the known purpose within this transaction when A's lawyer allows the advice to be shown to B? 
that B was intended to rely on it. Is that what's going on? Or was it accompanied by other statements by way of qualification which make it quite clear that that is not what's going on? So those are my five points from that survey of the authorities. So if independent inquiry doesn't come into your fifth point in assessing objective intention, came into your fourth. Well, yes, yes. I mean, it does because it doesn't do. Um, that's why I'm asking. In 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 the sense because the other statements by qualification, yes, in a sense, um, bolster the point, the fourth point, doesn't it? So if if I mean if uh, you know that. The Mr. Thornhill's advice is going to be made available to the investors, but the other material makes it clear to the investors that they should take their own advice yep. and they warrant that they will do so or have done so. Yep. Then um, that, in relation both to your fourth and your fifth points, yes, you say that negatives um, any duty of care. I do, and and the fifth point is, as I said, is another way of looking at the same thing. And, and it, if you look at the Mona Lisa, wherever you are in the room, her eyes seem to follow you. And it's the same with independent inquiry, because whichever of these points you look at, independent inquiry becomes quite important. Yeah. So you know, on, 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 on the fourth point, that when you say, well, it reasonable was it reasonable to rely? An independent inquiry stares you in the face, because that's a critical consideration. When you look at the fifth point, uh, was it the known purpose? Again, the eyes follow you around the room. Well, hang on. If they were supposed to make their own independent inquiry, how could it be the known purpose of the statement being communicated to them that they should rely on it? Yeah. It's, it's the same point, but looked at from different angles. So can I turn to the specifics? Unless there's anything further I can think of. Um, So, my lord, my ladies, at, at heart, this is actually a very simple case. And if I were a more courageous barrister, I would spend 15 minutes on three documents. I would point out they speak for themselves, but the answer is obvious. And I'd move on to breach or, or UFTA. Um, but if I were a more courageous barrister, I'd apply for summary judgment and save us a lot of trouble. Or possibly not, actually. Uh, I want to start with the IM. But before I do, I just want to say a word about the origins of the IM, because in this morning's debate, my lady, Lady Justice Clark, turned to Core 216, which is the letter of 16th. Is that only a sad one letter? Yes, it's a sad one letter, but yeah. sad one is the Fonzo Origo one. Yep. So it's, it's how it started. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and that was kind of... I, it just I, I then occurred to me that this isn't actually the last word. I just want to show you what I mean in the judgment. So th this this letter is referred to by the judge at um, 51 of the judgment, page 80 of the bundle. I mean, I'm afraid I, I would like to look at the judgment simply because it's, it's helpful to see how it arises. <coughs> So at 51, the judge refers to this letter and says this is the formal instructions to review the IM. And then at 52, he draws the conclusions from that about it was clear that he, he was aware it was going to be made available to potential investors, which is absolutely right. Uh, and, and then he, he recites an intermediate letter from Mr. Thornhill. And then on the 17th of January, he says 2002, but that's a typo for 2003. Yeah. And Scott's provided Mr. Thornhill with a memorial. Those are, those are his instructions which they call memorials. And then at 55, he says, the memorial was provided to Mr. Thornhill under cover of the letter, which said Warner Brothers had insisted that he obtain it before they'd be willing to let it out into the world. And they'd be asked if it would be possible for the opinion to be addressed to Barclays Bank. And I thought, oh my goodness, that letter isn't in the bundle. Um, I, I realised they say it was short of German, and I've got a, a, a ask for copies to be printed, which they have been. It's the questions that are under trading, isn't it, on the, in the next tab? <coughs> yes, the, that's the memorial, exactly yes. so. That's the memorial of the 17th of January 2003. Yep. 
and this is the letter which accompanied it. This is what came with it. So just, I see. We're, we're thinking about the, and, and the, this is the letter referred to in paragraph 55, and it, it, it's still got its trial bundle reference on it, which was A22, A being the core. So it was in the core bundle at trial. Um, <coughs> now, the, the, the point of this is, you can see that the, the judge summarizes it at paragraph 55. So the first point, point is that in the first paragraph it says, I enclose a memorial summarizing the various questions and instructions we've asked over the last few months. And that was absolutely right. You can see it in the memorial, which I know you've read. The memorial is a right old rag bag of, well, on the 16th of September you said this, and then in November we had a phone call, and then you sent an email, and it's trying to bring it all together. And here at the second paragraph, you see why, and this is what results in the opinion, is the actual opinion which is sued on. And that second paragraph, you can see that that was only done because of Warner Brothers. They said, I mean, you could see the impatience. I think they had Sidley Austin, a tidy American lawyer, going, for goodness sake, where's this bloke's advice? It's all over the shop. And so they said that we've insisted we get a long-form written opinion before this thing goes live. Uh, so please get on with it. And, and, and Mr. Thornhold worked on it, he said, over the weekend uh, to get it done. And then thirdly, it says, uh, and this is also of mild importance, it says, please let me know if it's possible to address to Barclays. Address it to Barclays. We don't mind. Maybe we can discuss this point later. So it, we don't mind being issued to Barclays and being available to Barclays as well as us. Maybe we can discuss this later. Um, so, I just didn't want it to be thought that core 2 slash 16 was the last word in, in how the opinion came about, but because it is, this is the last word on how the opinion came about. And, and as you can see, it was born out of a desire to unify all the various bits of advice, and he was asked if he, could, he would address it to Barclays. No answer was ever recorded. He couldn't remember, uh, but it was never done. But addressing it to Barclays would have been quite significant because obviously if you address your opinion to somebody, you know, that is a very powerful pointer towards, uh, uh, if you formally say this is to Barclays Bank, that would be a, an important consideration. And there's no request from the Scots in that letter to say, would you also address it to the investors, by contrast. Now, the IM, so it's in supplementary, I'm no, no, no longer confident that, that my bundle seems to be differently organized. No, it's in core, it's in core two, tab 23. Yeah. Yes. So th this is IM 2.0, as it were, because this is not the first one. Which is sad one. This is uh, the one for sad two. And there are some minor differences, but I think it's common ground that they don't matter. And it, it begins at 360 with a series of important notices. And this is a really important page, just, uh, I think it's common ground. And what this does is start to lay out the legal parameters. So, paragraph one. That makes it very clear that readers are expected to have access to their own advisors and to take whatever advice they think is appropriate. What this does not do is say, look, if you want anything clarified, just get in touch. We're happy to have it. It says, if you don't understand it, take your own advice. You're on your own book. Mm. Yesterday, my learned friend seemed to take the point that because this paragraph is clearly aimed at the actual investors, which it is, that somehow undermined the point in the next paragraph, that they had to have advisors. But not so. That nobody has ever suggested that the advisors literally couldn't read it, weren't, be, weren't allowed to be shown it. That, that, that wouldn't be a sensible approach at all. The point is it couldn't be marketed to them. It could only be marketed to investment professionals who would then show it to their own clients. And that's all set out in the second paragraph. Now, this is a critical paragraph. It explains that it's an unregulated collective investment scheme. <clears throat> and it explains the consequences of that, which are it can't be marketed to the public. It can only go to regulated investment professionals. 
and no one's intended to rely on it other than through a skilled advisor. Uh, and just keep your finger there, but just flick on to 379 at the top of the page. You see there that it says applications will therefore only be considered when received by a duly authorised intermediary. So Scots were taking this really seriously. They just wouldn't let anybody apply other than through an advisor. And going back to 360, paragraph 2 is, is what Scott's trying to do here is reflect the FISMA exemptions order. And I'd just like to show you this because I don't think it emerged quite clearly yesterday. Perhaps we could look at Authorities Bundle 5. It's ten forty six. <clears throat> now, this is at page one four one nine. We had bits of this yesterday, but we didn't have this bit, which is actually really the only relevant bit. Page one four one nine. You see section two three eight. which is the restrictions on promotion. And it says uh, uh, there's a general prohibition on communicating inducements to participate in collective investment schemes. That's 2381. It says you, you must, must not do it as, as an authorised person. And then it says the Treasury may by order, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, jumping down to sub 6, it says the Treasury may by order specify circumstances that subsection 1 does not apply. And, and if we flip to the next tab, tab 47, we see literally the first page, 1425. These are the orders, the rules, disapplying the general prohibition. And you can see that it says the Treasury and the exercise of its power conferred on by section 2386. So that, these are the exemptions. This is what allows you to mark uh, a collective investment. Uh, if we then look at... One four two eight. You see, uh, at, at Article two two, they, 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 they've now taken that general prohibition imposed by Section two three eight one, and they've they've redefined it as the scheme promotion restriction. Sorry, what? what? At, at one four two eight. One four two eight. Just two. above the word notes, there's a sub two. Oh, yeah, in this order, only reference to the scheme promotion restriction. means the restriction imposed by 2381, yep. which is what we just looked at. So that's now redefined as the scheme promotion restriction. And note unregulated scheme, just above that, is a collective investment scheme which is not various things. And, and this scheme was not any of those things. So it, it, this was that's why this was an unregulated collective mm -hmm. investment scheme. And the Article 3 next page says that it defines communication and any communication in this order is an in, a reference to an invitation or inducement to participate in an unregulated scheme. So this is all about the promotion of unregulated schemes, which is exactly the territory that the SAD schemes were in. And it then sets out a whole load of exemptions where you can promote them. And the relevant one for us is Article 14, which is on page one. Double four nine investment professionals. And it says that the scheme promotion restriction, that's the general ban in section two three eight, does not apply to any apply to any communication, that's a communication about an unregulated scheme, as we've seen, which A is only made to recipients whom the person making the communication believes on reasonable grounds to be investment professionals or may be reasonably regarded as directed only at such recipients. So investment professionals are then defined at the bottom of the page. It basically means authorised people for, for our purposes. So this is what Scots are trying to do. They're trying to, to, to make sure that they're within Article 14.1a. Uh, my learned friend had a rather half-hearted go yesterday on C at the bottom of this page, suggesting that Maybe Scots didn't have proper procedures in, in place. Uh, 
It wasn't alleged. It wasn't argued. There was no evidence directed at it at trial. There's no evidential basis for that at all. But the core point, really, is that Scots were obviously on Section 4, uh, Article 14.1a only made to people who are investment professionals, rather than B, which is the only point where 4C comes in. So I've taken that up at some speed, but uh, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's like a peripheral issue. So if we put that away and go back to the, uh, the information memorandum itself, at core 223.360, this second paragraph was saying that this, this is directed at investment professionals and any other exempt persons who are the ultra-sophisticates, ultra-sophisticates, uh, such as high net worth individuals. Um, so this is a clear warning that no investor should rely on this on their own without the benefit of a professional, experienced person advising them. And the judge accepted this, and this is a really important finding. It's in the judgment at paragraph 24, which is at page 75 of Court 1. When you said the judge accepted this, what do you mean? Accepted it was in the IM? Accepted? No, he's made, he's made a finding on the law here and, and, and about the effect of this paragraph. So do you have paragraph 24? Yeah. So the judge, at paragraph 24, he sets out the provisions I've uh, recited, and he says, and, well, and he sets out the terms of the notice, this paragraph 2, and he says, this meant, so this is a direct finding about the effect of the law in this paragraph, that none of the claimants was entitled to rely directly on the IM, but could only do so through and with the benefit of their own IFA. And then, as he points out, it's reinforced by the statement later. Um, that's, there's no appeal against that, and that, that is, that's the judge's conclusion, which is quite right, on the effect of the regulation and the wording of paragraph two. You're not intended to rely on this on your own. So there's a formal regulatory structure which classifies this investment as sufficiently complex and sufficiently risky that it can't be promoted lawfully to the public, And it has, every investor has to be guided, either be ultra high net worth, high net worth, <coughs> or to have the filter of an investment professional. So uh, where that plays into the points I was making on the authorities is that whatever you call it, intermediate, intermediate inspection, independent advice, the means by which the investors could carry out, could reasonably be expected to carry out an independent inquiry, is literally baked into the structure of this transaction. It's not something Scots have imposed on them. It's regulation that has imposed it. And so both the regulation and the IM, which is complying with the regulation, cement in a situation in which no investor is unguided and nobody can rely on it without going through their advisor. And I'll come back to the importance of the IFAs when I deal with my learned friends' attempt to belittle them and their skills. So that's paragraph two on page 360. Paragraph three, uh, the important bit of that is the last sentence. So the second paragraph says, these schemes aren't authorised or approved by the FSA. And then the next paragraph says, participants should note that most of the protections under FISMA do not apply to investments in the partnerships, and compensation is not available. And that is um, restated at page 378 on, in the general risk warnings, which says the interests of the partners in the partnership will not be subject to the protection of FISMA and not covered by the compensation scheme or any other and what was that advice I'm information sorry. on which the investors were supposed to rely? That sentence. It's page 378. Uh, on on page, page 360, 360 yes. so it's the last sentence of paragraph and three. And is that, that it, information or advice on which the investors were intended to rely? 
and for which Scots accepted responsibility. So which participants should to note that most of the protections do not apply to investments and the compensation under the FCS, FSCS was not available. Yes, that's that's the last sentence of paragraph yes. three. Yes. And then what I was just going on to say that if you turn to page 378, it just says that. I mean, it says the same thing again yes. uh, in the general risk plan. And that was advice or information in the IM upon which the investors were intended to and entitled to rely? What, to, to being told that it wasn't subject to FISMA, was that yeah, advice? Yeah, they, they should note, that being advised, they should note that most of, I'm just, it's just a question. Yes, I mean, they're being, they're being kind of, it's, it's, um, how can I put it? Uh, they're being notified, this, this is a sort of red notice saying, look, this is unregulated territory, you, you don't get any FISMA protection here, you don't, you're not going to get any kind of conversation this hasn't been authorised or approved by the FSA. You're on your own. And, and, and given the way that my learned friend has repeatedly in, invoked statutory analogies, I think this is quite important. Because this isn't a scheme that's within any relevant regulation. They, they, they just don't apply. This is unregulated. And, and, and so let me pick up my learned friend's point on, on the statutory analogies. Now his proposition, as far as I could follow it, is twofold. The first, either Scots or Mr Thornhill or both, it, it was never very clear, would have been liable under the 2003 FISMA regime if it had applied to the schemes. Proposition one. And proposition two, therefore, the common law should impose the same liability because the common law ought to be coherent with the statute, and this is a prospectus case. Now, both of those points are fundamentally wrong. As to whether Scots would have been liable, or almost the or anyone, but focusing on Scots for a moment, whether they'd have been liable under FISMA, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be unfair, but basically this is an argument about whether my learned friend's clients could have brought an action against an entity they didn't sue under a statutory regime which didn't apply. It, it's just completely sterile debate. It's not helpful for the court, and I, I really don't want to waste too much time on it. If FISMA had applied, which it didn't, there would have been obvious lines of defense for Scots and for Mr. Thornhill. So Scots could have said, well, we're within the Schedule 10, Paragraph 1 defense. We had an honest belief following reasonable inquiry. Mr. Thornhill, could have questioned the extent to which, under the specific wording of FISMA regulation, whether he fell within the concept of having authorised uh, the IM, or, or whether he'd given advice on its contents in a professional capacity. I mean, there, there are lots of points available to him. None of these were explored with him at the trial. He wasn't questioned about them. It wasn't an argument before the judge. None of this was done. And the reason none of it was done is because it didn't apply. None of this is relevant. Everybody knew that FISMA didn't apply because the IM said so. so. So trying to draw parallels with it really is pointless. And my learned friend at times has actually seemed to forget that FISMA didn't apply. So yesterday he told you that this paragraph was Scott's setting up a paragraph four, was Scott's setting up a statutory defence. Uh, and when he was making submissions about the meaning of the warranties yesterday, he said that the judge's construction would make a nonsense of the statutory regime. And we had it again this morning, references to the statutory regime. But there's just no basis <coughs> for that line of argument because the statutory regime didn't apply. It's its own regime. We're outside it. But um, since my own friend is trying to invoke it in some sort of shadowy way, can I just show you one piece of, of the regime which didn't apply? Uh, which is very mildly helpful, and that's FISMA section 80, in, as in force at the time. That's Authorities 5, tab 55. So you'll recall, maybe, that you were shown section 90 of FISMA which is about liability for listing particulars. 
and that's at page 1556. But, but the bit you weren't showing, which I would like to show you, is section 80, which starts at 1553. And section 90 makes you liable for misleading statements in listing particulars, which these weren't. But, uh, section 80 tells you what ought to be in the listing particulars in the first place. So this is actually quite important. And so you see there's a general duty at section 80 sub 1, all such information as investors and their professional advisors would reasonably require, and reasonably specific to find there for the purpose of making an informed assessment. So, so note investors and their professional advisors, and then drop your eye down to sub 4. In determining what information subsection 1 requires to be included in listing particulars, regard must be had in particular to the nature of securities and their issuer. That, that's not really, there's no parent. The nature of the person is likely to consider acquiring them. Well, that's jolly important here, because you've got wealthy people who can only access the scheme through an advisor, that's how I, that's how I be. And then over the page 1554 at C, the fact that certain matters may reasonably be expected to be within the knowledge of professional advisors, of a kind which persons likely to acquire the securities may reasonably be inspected to consult. Now, that is actually mildly interesting. But if you run that against this scheme, well, would persons likely to invest in this scheme, who are the persons likely to invest in this scheme? They're people trying to avoid tax with a lot of money. Would those people reasonably be expected to consult tax advisors? Yes, they would. Because rich people who are interested in avoiding tax always have their own advisors. We'll see some authority on that later. Or can reasonably be expected to have their own tax advisors. And they're told to take their own tax advice. Would tax advisors, so that's the people, and then look at within the knowledge of professional advisors, well, would tax advisors reasonably be expected to have within their knowledge the statutory tests for trading on a commercial basis with a view to profit? Yes, they would. My learned friend told you yesterday that these have been around since the dawn of income tax. So if you were inclined to draw anything from this non-applicable regime, which you shouldn't, it would be once again to draw the proposition that it is reasonable for a representor to tailor what they say by reference to what independent advice the representee can reasonably be expected to take. And that is especially so, although that I don't get that from, from the first one, if they've been told to take it. So that's, that's the first proposition of you know, FISMA somehow applied, or is a useful parallel, none, none of which is true. But my learned friend's second proposition is that the common law should impose whatever protections are imposed by the statutory regime, regime simply because that's the right result. And um, lords, my lord, my ladies, that th this is a very difficult submission to follow. Essentially, he seemed to be saying that the common law should mimic statute, which is just contrary to first principles. Uh, but secondly, he was saying that even where the statutory regime specifically says, well, in this type of case, you have statutory protections, but in this type of case, this is unregulated, and you get no statutory protections, you're on your own. Even there, the common law should step in and should impose the protections which the statutory regime has expressly declined to provide. So according to this argument, the common law decides what to do. It, it, Common law decides to do what the statute has deliberately not done, and it should do this because the statute, quote, shows the result that the common law ought to reach, unquote, even though the actual result of the statute is that there aren't any protections. But the bottom line on all this is that, is that the, the, statute, the statutory regime in, in two, section 238 of FISCA makes it clear that there's a prohibition on this sort of unregulated investment being sold to individuals, 
they, it, they have to be sold via independent financial advisors. Yes. And, and the Treasury has said so in terms that the only exception that applies is if there are independent financial advisors. And when you take that, uh, those facts, I mean, never mind what's in, in the statute regime which doesn't apply, but the, the, one that the doesn't inference apply. that one draws from that is that it, the, the protection that is given to the individuals in relation to the unregulated investment is through having the independent financial advisors. Yes, exactly so. So these aren't some sort of, um, the, these aren't sort of, um, well, the suggestion from Mr. Stuart Yesson was rather that these were uh, akin to the second-hand car salesman. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Because the, the IFA is actually, some of them, are, and there's plenty of evidence on this in the case, and fa fa factual findings by the judgment, by the judge, which are not appealed. No. But there are uh, plenty of evidence that there are some very highly skilled IFAs indeed. Yeah. Some of them create their own schemes. They, 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 they do a Scots. They're at the top end of the market, there are some really smart operators. Uh, and I, I want to take that, take a little bit of time over that. Well, should we break now? But I think that's the point. Should we break now for five minutes? And you can come back.
stream. Uh, you have you ever been in, been in uh, against assumption or benevolent assumption? I have. Is it a ray of nervous ticks? I uh, once wrote quite a long time ago an advice where I was quite a great man. And uh, he never actually acknowledged the advice. We were doing joint advice. He never acknowledged, as far as I can see, receipt of the advice. That sounds pretty snappy. Oh. <laughs> Tell you the rest of the story. I think this probably is a convenient moment just to, to dive out of the IM and think about the IFA. Um, let's start with the judgment. We've, we've had paragraph 24 where the judge finds what the regime is and says that means you're not entitled to rely directly on the IM. You can only do so through the IFA. Fine. We then turn to paragraph 102. That's on call 110, page 93. And here the judge it was arguing about, at that point, the, the claimants were saying, well, you can't look too closely at the wording of these, um, uh, these, these documents. It's, it's, it's only designed to be read by laymen. That was the sort of basic point. And there was an argument about that. And the judge said, look, it's what it means on an objective basis. Hmm. And then the second half of 102, he said, it's important to remember that the schemes could only be marketed through the IFAs who could reasonably be expected, so this is the reasonable expectation in the twin NRAM test on the advisor side of the fence, who could reasonably be expected to be familiar with the language, and who it could reasonably be assumed would explain the documentation to their clients. Now, now that's important because anybody in Mr. Thornhill's position could proceed on the basis that the finance professionals who were advising these uh, wealthy investors could explain the documents to them, the IM, the subscription agreement, checklist. So investors could reasonably expect that they're not on their own to have guidance about the importance of phrases like however potential investors are advised to consult their own tax advisors or a warranty that they've only relied on or only consulted with their own professional advisors with regard to tax. The, the, the judge says they are. it's reasonable to assume that they're going to be guided. Then paragraph 119 <coughs> which is page 97. This is one of his core reasons on <coughs> the taking of independent professional advice. He says, uh, fourth, could only be marketed via, uh, via independent professional advisors so that all have the benefit. Reasonable for Mr. Thornhill to expect a even if the terms might be unfamiliar, the significance of the recommendation to take advice, the significance of the warranty that they'd only rely, the significance of the fact that Scots was acting on an execution-only basis, that actually that's just a sad one, would be brought home to them by that IFA. Moreover, he says, it was reasonable to expect that the investor's IFA would appreciate the importance of independent advice. It could either provide that advice on the tax aspects of the scheme itself, Brackets, there being at least some IFAs in the market with sufficient expertise to do so, close brackets, or assist the investor in obtaining independent advice from a suitably qualified specialist. Now, again, two points from that. The first is that they should appreciate the, that, that, that second half of the paragraph. The IFA should appreciate how important it was to get independent advice. So that's advice not from the selling entity. And second, they should either give it themselves, which some of them could do, or it's reasonable to accept, but some of them could do, or they should say to the investor, look, I can't do this. <coughs> you need to go to someone else. Now, that second proposition is, is obvious. Uh, the judge could have bolstered it with authority had he wanted to do so. He, he didn't because it's obvious, but just for your note, Supplemental Bundle 1, tab 19, page 164, that's an extract from our 
either open or closing submissions, I can't remember which, where we set out authority which says, look, if you're an IFA, it's an IFA negligence case, it's called Ockwell. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't understand it yourself, you say to your client, right, well, you, you need you need someone else. Uh, but, but that's not the second proposition isn't the one I'm interested in at the moment. It's that first one. <clears throat> that says some of them were good enough to do this themselves. Now, as I said, th these findings are not appealed, but I do want to put some flesh on this page because we've had a constant drip drip of sneering from my learned friend at IFAs on the basis that we should all just think it's really obvious that, that none of them are, uh, could possibly have spotted risks in these schemes. And, and that is just wrong. The, in 2003 to four, not only was there a world of tax schemes you could buy into, but there was another world of tax IFAs, specialist tax avoidance IFAs, who, whose whole raison d'etre was evaluating tax schemes and deciding whether or not to put their clients into them. That, that was what they did. And, and it's important to, to note it's a vetting process. You know, they, they open up the tax efficient review. And they go, right, okay, there's eight schemes here. Which, which one do I think is good? Where, where, what am I going to say to my clients? when I, you know, Which one of these am I going to pick? They, they vet them. And, and Ward are an absolute paradigm case here. And here I do want to show you a document. Uh, this is Supplementary Bundle 2, tab 68, please. So this is the Ward Consultancy PLC, I mean, note PLC uh, brochure from the time which one of the investors had obtained. Financial and tax advisors, the, the asterisk, which you, asterisk which you see all the way through by tax advisors, and it says not regulated. Um, tax shelter investment schemes. And then if we go on to page 449, we can see the introduction. This is them setting out their stool. Um, there are lots of ways of sheltering and avoiding tax. It's been difficult to, to find advice on that. So we have developed an approach to tax sheltering that is seldom available from other sources of financial advice. By a combination of financial and tax advice, we can design, note, and implement a tax shelter strategy that's designed for the requirements of each private client. We prepare a tax shelter plan which can avoid and defer all income tax and capital gains tax in the current tax year and the previous three tax years using schemes which utilize existing UK tax legislation. This includes tax already paid, which can be reclaimed. Now, that, if I may say so, is high octane tax avoidance because that is what almost all the sample and lots of the other claimants, I assume, which I, I can't make that assertion, but I'm attracted to that to sell, I only know about the sample. That's what they were trying to do, lots of them. They wanted to pay no tax at all for the current tax year and the previous three tax years. And that's what they were using the scheme to do in conjunction with that IFA. How many of the sample claimants mm -hmm. used Ward? Quite a lot of them. Five of the sample, half the sample. At uh, Ward were, I can't tell you the precise You don't number. know how many of the 110? It was, th there were three big ones. There was Ward, there was Kirk and Mott, and there was an outfit called My New Financial Advisor. Those were the three, and they accounted for, I think, 80 to 90 of the 110. I think Ward were the biggest of those three. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, it's not surprising, because when, when you are a specialist tax avoidance IFA, you, know, you, you put your clients into... Thing. So if you take a view on a scheme, you think that's a good one. So you, you see lots of people who've got a common IFA. I, I mean, footnote, which means, of course, they've got the possibility of bringing a group action against the IFA, yeah. uh, which is what happened in the Peacock case, which I, I told you about in the footnote in our, in our skeleton. Uh, 
and, the, and they settled with the IFA and dropped it against Mr. Peacock. The, you also get not only clusters of people within particular IFAs, but clusters of people within particular organisations. So Kirk and Mott had a line into Deutsche Bank. So you get lots of people from Deutsche Bank who are, are signing up. And you get, in some schemes, you get lots of footballers because there's a football agent. And, you know, there's always a common thread or, or an IFA who's got a link into the football world. Um, but Ward were particularly keen on this scheme. They promoted it widely among their clients. And so we got a lot of them in the song. And they did what Ward, in this very general brochure, this isn't about SAG, this is, this is just what they do. This isn't about the schemes. This is just their general modus operandi, which is pay no tax for four years. Uh, now, that is an exceptionally aggressive piece of tax planning. It seriously increased the octane weighting. Because if you tried writing to your tax office and saying, I would like all the tax back, I've paid for the last three years, and I'm not going to pay any tax this year. You are going to set off every klaxon in the building. Your, your file gets a red sticker on it, and you're off to the races. And that's not Mr. Thornhill's sphere. That's, that's his advisors. They could say, look, oh, have, you, know, you could have a nibble on this, have a small investment. But that's not what they did. They piled in to try to wipe out all their tax liabilities, and, and the consequences were inevitable. <coughs> but that's not... That's buy side problem. That's not sell side problem. If we look at the, just the last paragraph on this page, we see this approach has enabled war consultancy to emerge as one of the UK's leading advisors on tax shelter schemes, which may be self aggrandizing, but it's true. And in 2000 to 2001, our private clients invested over a quarter of a billion pounds in these investments. Saving more in these arrangements, saving more than a hundred million pounds of tax. That's in one year. Uh, we are not talking about high street IFAs who say to you, "Have you thought about topping up your ISA?" And let me tell you about the new pension regulations. This is a big business, and they're dealing in very large numbers, and they are properly sophisticated. And, and we can see that sophistication point at page four seven two. which is, I think, the last page, or nearly the last page of, of the same brochure. They, they say a bit about themselves. Uh, founded in 84, so they've been in business, been in business for a long time. Uh, independent financial and tax advisors, providing private client financial services. Uh, and then they say, services include managing and advising on flexible employee benefits and providing highly specialised tax shelter and investment advice to private clients. Again, they say one of the UK's leading tax shelter specialists. Uh, look, look at the next bit. The company's focus is on building client relationships and providing its clients with innovative opportunities to reduce or eliminate their tax liabilities. And then they give the numbers again, and then they say what new sectors they are developing into. <coughs> yeah, these people going back to 119, are the people who could, which underlie the judge's finding, that there were at least some AFIs in the market with sufficient expertise to look at a tax scheme, to look at an IM, to look at Mr. Thornton's opinion and go, that's a bit punchy, don't do this one, or, yep, this one flies. That's their job. Now, there are other examples too, which I'll show you a couple very briefly. We can put away sub two. Go back to the judgment for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and just go to the appendix, appendix two. So I'm sure you've seen that appendix two is the judge's specific. Um, yeah. I was going to say person by person, but it is actually man by man because they're all they were all male. Uh, the sample about each one of them. And so we just start with the first one, Mr. Brickman, and you, it, it's page, I'm so sorry, page 159, which is the start of Appendix 2. So call 1, yep. tab 10, page 159. So Mr. Brickman was the chief actuary at XL Re, and uh, if you look at paragraph 2, this is actually quite interesting. He had an existing IFA, they were called Perfect Day, 
but Mr. Brickman wanted to, 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 to reduce his tax bill. And so, and Perfect Day said, that's not our gig. You know, we, you know, we're the guys who go increase your ISA. You need a specialist. So they passed him on to 2020, and he, they did that because 2020 had, quote, greater specialism in, among other things, tax matters. So this is a kind of, this is the market in action, as it were. This is one eye of the IFA going, you know, client comes along and says, I don't like paying all this tax, what can I do? IFA says, I don't know, but I know a man who knows. Let me pass you on. Um, Mr. Mr. Brickman was not a ward client, but he was, as you can see at paragraph three, someone who was trying to pay uh, no tax, sheltering all his income tax bill for the previous three years. That's line five of paragraph three. So he wasn't a ward client, and this is quite interesting. But 2020 were trying to do exactly the same thing that ward said they could do. So no tax, multiple years. Uh, And you see at paragraph three that Dr. Martin of 2020 wrote him an advice letter in which he said, it's about three because of the way down, so the recommendation to invest in SAV3 was made, quote, having researched the market using Allen Bridge tax shelter reports and was made because, you know, having assessed the market, that SAV3 was one of the few film partnerships <laughs> to provide the combination of benefits you require. Now, the... The Allen Bridge tax reports we had in evidence, and they are, I don't know why, but they're in authorities bundle at, tab, uh, at, at bundle five, tabs 53 and 54. Now, th these are quite dense, and I'm not going to take up a lot of time with them. But uh, m my lady, lady just said I may be familiar with this sort of thing, but they, these are, this is a, these are exemplars of it. It's like if you want to buy a washing machine, you go to which or you know, the good washing machine guide. And, and this is the good tech scheme guide. This is market information out there, especially for market professionals, saying what's new, what's coming up, what are the problems, what, what do you think? And uh, they, they have a real depth of knowledge and market acumen, which was available to market professionals like Mr. Brickman's IFA. So if we look at uh, paragraph 1526. Page. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry, page, thank you. Page 1526. This is, is an overview of film partnerships. Uh, that's what this, this, this one is about. And the first three paragraphs are just setting out what they do and say it, it's, it's all about risk. So the least risky structures defer rather than avoid in the second paragraph. Um, decision may be fairly marginal. Many believe tax deferral to be a prudent strategy. Better hang on to it than offer it up to the tax man. More speculative the partnership, more likely the life to end up worse off. This guide helps you to understand the main types of partnership and point out the risk areas. So that that's what they, this type of thing is, is all about. And they then, if you go on to 1534, you can see non-section 48 partnerships. So that's this type of partnership. In that. This is not a specific British relief type partnership. This is a, a, a general partnership, not <coughs> under section 48 by other principles. And then you see over the page, you see at 1535, the P and A partnerships. Now that's Scots. That's what they were talking about here. That, that's the P and A partnership structure. And it, you can see this is new. Second little paragraph it says the structure is new. It's only been available for very large investments. We we describe it for completeness. And then it describes the tax arbitrage, which results from the exercise of the option. That's at the, at the bottom. Uh, and it points out the high hurdle rate if the option is not exercised. So it's, it's done a proper job on this. And then it concludes these partnerships have not been tested with the inland revenue. So that's what they have to say in that issue. If you then look at tab 54, which is the next issue, I think 
is the next issue. Yes, that, that one was September 2003. This one's October 2003. This is right at the time that SAD2 is launched into the market. Tax shelter report, and you can see at page 1541, film partnerships compared reviews, say and lease back production partnerships, section 42, non section 48 production partnerships. And that's, that is the one that we're interested in. And if you just look at page 1542, Again, there's the blurb at the beginning, at the top, saying that we're trying to help you calibrate risk. Which, as I keep saying, that's the buy side job. Risk calibration is for buyer's advisors. And then it can, there's, a, there's sort of tables setting them all down at the bottom. You've got non-section 48 P and A, that's SAD which they give, if you, the, the, the column headings are at the top, commercial risk, uh, department of culture, media and sport, inland revenue risk, I mean, it's, it's those two really, it's inland revenue risk that we're really interested in. But inland revenue risk, it says media raises new questions. Now, so this is the sort of thing that Mr. Well, this, Mr. Brickman's specialist IFA did in fact access these, but any IFA could access these. They are informed, intelligent, third-party commentary specifically aimed at helping IFAs undertake their regulatory obligation, which is to advise on risk. Now, uh, I mentioned to you, we can put away authorities fine. I, I mentioned to you earlier that the judge had referred to the tax-efficient review as an example in this area, and, and that's also worth a look at. That's sub one, tab 22. No, bad reference. I'm sorry, I think that's a bad reference. Just hold, hold with me. Oh, you know, it is, that is right. It is right, I'm so sorry. Sub one, tab 22. So it's attached to a witness statement from Mr. Thornhill, uh, which was made during the trial. Because there was a little spat at, at, about uh, some communications that he had had with the editor, Mr. Churchill, and the claims required it to be proved by a witness statement, which, which was done. So, uh, and this attached. So basically, Mr. Churchill, who edited, was a very knowledgeable tax advisor. He'd looked, he'd run the Rule 8 scheme. He, he didn't think that much of it. Of it. He published a slightly negative review in the Tax Efficient Review. There was a bit of a hoo-ha with Scots. They didn't go a bit cross. Uh, that, that's the background to it. So uh, you, can, you can see at page 237 that it reviews three film partnerships, First Choice, Microfusion, and uh, SAD. And uh, if we just go on to 239, There's a general market commentary, you know, what's going on in this tax avoidance market, what types of schemes are out there, you know, what, what's going on. There's a criticism saying that risk warnings in most IMs don't cover the downside risk adequately, <coughs> uh, which I, th I think is about investment rather than tax risk. Uh, and then at the bottom, it says not much was raised by the production schemes. So a number of new types of schemes have appeared. Section 48, micro fusion, equity sale and lease back first mezzanine, Production distribution scheme with limited downside, first choice in Scots Atlantic. And then at the bottom, in the in Scots Atlantic one, and, and, and someone called First Choice, created a great deal of interest in the market. And I view the attraction of these offerings as a trade off between one, acceptability of product to tax authorities, i.e., the risk of a tax objection, two, potential revenues from film choice, three, returns to investors. And then over the page, you see again at 240. The main risk seems to be the attitude of the revenue in a number of areas, including whether they're trading, are they trading with a view to profit, will any accounting write down if used go unchallenged, could the revenue look through the structures, could they claim that the transaction structure has the currency money still remain paying the purposes of avoidance of tax. And then it says the increasing complexity and untested nature of the new schemes reviewed in this issue means that investors may wish to consider taking tax advice before investing. And they say that 
In the full knowledge, page 247, if you turn on the uh, that the SAD scheme, which they've just been critiquing, has as its tax counsel, Mr. Andrew Thornhill, Queen's Counsel. They don't do what my learned friend has been trying to suggest to you they do. But all oh, known crime, they can possibly second guess the great Mr. Thornhill. And we, we are only humble IFAs. We have no idea how to assess this scheme. They, they know that he's advised on it. They set out their own views on it. They say, look, if you want to go to this one, you might, you might want to think about taking some advice. It, the, the, the overstatement that there has been in the last day and a half of the in, in, importance of the fact that he's named as a head of chambers, for goodness sake, uh, it, it's all very overcooked. Because what this material shows is that there's a lot of intelligent market commentary which can identify risks. And you see, we, if we see that, just I'm, I'm going to leave the scene. But if you, you look over the page 248, first of all, at the bottom of the page, it says how well respected Scots were. Major and respected player in the film scheme market with over 20 partnerships, owning over 300 million of the film. Uh, gives a career of Mr. Driver and Mr. Somper. And Mr. Driver been a partner in Deloitte, Mr. Somper was a solicitor, had been head of business affairs with Warner Brothers and an ex-partner of Berman Lake. So, you know, these, these are serious players. Uh, they were at the time. I mean, I have, I, I, so, my lady, lady just similar may know already, but Mr. Driver, unfortunately, had a fall from grace in, and there's a law report from 2013, which Mr. Thornhill was cross-examined on at the trial. So 10 years later, Mr. Driver had a, a real scrape and I think he destroyed some evidence. And so he fell from grace. But at this time, 2003, he's riding very high in the market. He's got a very strong reputation. But, and he's been to Mr. Thornhill. But over the page, you can see at 249 that Mr. Churchill in the tax efficient review he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not afraid to say, well, I think there could be problems with this. He says, tax, the, the, the headings on the left have gone out of line with the paragraphs they're referring to on the right. But there's a heading on the left, tax risk, and just below to the right. It says tax risk is very hard to quantify. It must revolve around a number of areas, including whether they're trading, whether they're carrying out a commercial activity in a commercial way, are they trading with a view to profit? In innovative scheme, but unproven. Now, but my, my point here isn't really what the independent assessment said, but the point is that they existed. So if you're an IFA, doing some due diligence for your side of the fence, for your client, for the buyer, this is the sort of stuff that you can look at. If we, if we can put away sub one and go back to the judgment, appendix two. And just looking again at that paragraph three, right at the end, on page 159, yeah, sorry, judgment, page 159, beginning of, very beginning of appendix two. At the end of Dr. Martin's advice letter, his formal regulatory advice letter to Mr. Brickman, he said, I draw your attention to risks. He said there's some risks which aren't, which aren't recorded, but it includes your advice to take advice from an accountant and solicitor. So Mr. Mr. Dr. Martin's really covering himself. And when I asked Mr. Brickman about this in cross-examination, you can see it, paragraph four, he said, I was getting personal advice on the risks of this from Dr. Martin. That was his perception at the time. And it was on all aspects, including tax. And he didn't <coughs> seek advice from anybody else. Now, the same bunch, 2020, also advised Mr. Whitley, Whiteley. Uh, that's for your note, paragraph 136 of this appendix. At paragraph five, just note that single sentence. What Dr. Martin didn't do is say, oh, well, Mr. Thornhill said it that way, so that's fine. He literally did not refer to Mr. Thornhill in his advice at all. And that is what you would expect. The last thing you want from your independent advisor is for them to say, oh, well, the seller says it's fine, so it'll be fine. That would be a totally unprofessional attitude. 
And it's not what Dr. Martin did. He analyzed it for himself, which is, of course, what, what he should have done. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you just one more, because this adds a, an interesting... Well, none, none of the ten um, at any stage said, well, don't worry, Mr. Thornhall's advice on this, so you needn't be concerned. Uh, they, all, they, they all said, I think, now, I, I, my memory's already been shown to be faulty in the trial, so um, I've got to be careful. Yeah. But my memory is that the, almost all of them said that their IFA had said orally to them, Ah, yeah. oh, you can write Mr. Thornton, he's great. It's and, not um, yeah. yeah, but the judge found that they hadn't, in fact, exactly. relied on it. Exactly. And, and, and found quite often that that hadn't been said. And that's only findings in relation to 10 out of 110. That's true, because that, I mean, that's, that's, a kind of, that's not a common issue of reliance. It's, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a person by person issue. Uh, but at the moment, what I'm on is a duty point. So just, I know there's been a lot of detail, but just to sort of back off what so we're doing. So are you going to show us one other? Yeah, let me show you one more, because this is interesting. This is Mr. Yates. So um, if you just look at page 167, paragraph 48. Now, this is our first non-specialist advisor, because Warder specialists, uh, we saw that brochure, 2020 specialists, we saw that from Mr. Brickman. Mr. Yates went to Kirk and Mott, who were actually one of the big three, and they, uh, they're the ones with loads of plants of Deutsche, which includes, includes Mr. Yates. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he said that, well, they weren't specialists and they were just a facilitator, and they didn't give me any advice on the merits. Now, I, I couldn't challenge him on that, because... All his emails were at Deutsche, and he'd asked Deutsche for them, and they'd said, you can't, either you can't have them or they've been deleted. You know, so that I literally had no exchanges between him and his IFA to go on. But fortunately, one document had survived, uh, to, which they'd sent all their clients, including, <coughs> it was to be inferred, Mr. Yates. And you see that at, one, at paragraph 48, <clears throat> which is about a, a change in the rules by the England Revenue. So what happened was that just as the scheme was about to close, uh, I think it closed in March 2004, in February 2004, HMRC made an announcement about how they were changing the rules. So it was a bit of a kerfuffle. Does this spike the scheme? Does it still work? Mr. Thornhill gave some advice uh, that, to, to, to Scots. There was a bit of a, a general um, beating of the bounds. Mm -hmm. And what Kirk and Mott did was go and take their own advice. So they wanted to check that this change in the rules wasn't going to spike the scheme that they've been putting their clients into, merrily. So they say here, we have taken extensive advice from our own tax consultants, from the providers of the schemes themselves, and from independent tax counsel. And what we can report back is, is jolly good news. And over the page, you, the judge makes a factual finding that Kirk and Morton probably did the same thing when they recommended him into SAD 1 in the first place. That's a finding about SAD, I think it's SAD 3 in person. Now, the, the, the point here <coughs> is that, um, first of all, Kirk and Mott are recognized that they, they need some help. But secondly, they have invested their own money in taking some specialist advice. And that is a completely normal and understandable thing for IFAs to do. The IFAs in this case were, got a very substantial commission. Uh, Scots were taking out about 11 million. And I think the IFAs collectively, we, we, we've got a reference to it somewhere, but they were taking out somewhere of three, three or four million. I look behind me and I'll get, I'll get a better figure in a moment. But they, they, the IFAs were getting very substantial commissions. I mean, just one commission on one big investment was more than the whole fees that Mr. Thornhill got for the whole scheme for months of work. So they, they've got money to spend. And if they think, not sure, they can, they can go to anybody. They can go to EY, they can go to Deborah Chance, they can go to Pump Court Tax Chambers, they, they can... Do they have to take any advice that they want if they don't feel they've got the in-house expertise? Because they've got money to burn. 
And you only have to take it once, and then you feel safe for all your clients to put it into. And the judges found that, that is what Kirk and Mott did uh, in relation to putting their clients into this scheme. So, kind of just standing back and, and looking at it in stages, that the, the authorities which we went through show that there's an expectation of independent view. The, sorry, that the authorities show that if there is an expectation of independent inquiry, then that is a very clear, not reasonable to rely pointer. Second, the regulatory structure bakes in independent advice. The core documents, which I, I, I haven't really got going on yet, but they show that the investors were told to take their own tax advice and had to promise they'd done so. And what this now adds is to show that it was entirely reasonable, objectively reasonable, for any tax self in Mr. Thornhill's position to believe that good quality, independent tax advice could be given to an investor simply by a mandatory IFA. There's absolutely no need, as my learned friend keeps suggesting, to go to a tax seal, because IFAs either have the scheme, the skills themselves, or they could do some due diligence and they could instruct other people if they needed to. And that was exactly Mr. Thornhill's evidence about his subjective state of mind. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to show you very quickly a bit of that. I mean, I know it's only his subjective state of mind, but I just want to show you that because it's been put in the bundle by my learned friends, and, and, and I want to make sure there's no misunderstanding about it. It's supplementary Is it to... Is it no, no. I don't it's really not really, is it? It matters what Mr. Thornhill thought about no. or indeed no. what happened on the ground, say, forensically, on the last section of what actually happened in terms of carrying out the objective test. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I... test. Both, both limbs of the, of the NRAM test are objective. But, yeah, they're objective and they're prospective. As my lady, my lady lady just currently said. And the issue I, is, would, would a reasonable tax silk in, in, in Mr. Thornhill's position have, have thought that yeah. um, they would take their own advice? Take their own advice, and that they're but good as people. As he said that they did, it doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't really yeah. advance it, does it? So, it, it, the material is feel obliged to take us to material which isn't really no. in the whole picture. All right, I'll, I'll just give you the reference. Uh, it's, it's in, well, <laughs> Just in case. case. Just, just in case. case. No, I'm not, not going to show it to you. Seriously, no, if, it's if, if, if it was on our reading list, then we've read it, so we don't need to read it again. <laughs> is that we a warranty your Lordship is offering? Read, read, everything read, on the reading list. We read um, whatever it was you invited us to read from the class. Okay, okay. well, there's, there's, there's just there's one bit of it. In re examination, I said to Mr. Thornhill, it said. But, but you remember well, Mr. Uh, of course. Uh, I do remember that bit well. Good. Yes. I, I'm so sorry. I, I mean, that, that bit about when. No, I'm, it doesn't come off the transcript, but knowing Mr. Thornhill, I suspect that what he was doing was having a rueful laugh at his own. He said, yeah, I should have done that, shouldn't I? I suspect it was something like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I enjoyed the forensic kick off as much as the, the next man. Yeah. The, the, I'm just wondering the quality of this witness's evidence, yes. given the demonstration <laughs> which we've already seen. <laughs> well, guy, it was pretty poor. <laughs> it was pretty poor. Right? <laughs> In re-examination, I said, well, how do you know? How do you know that I face really good? And he said, because they come and take my advice. And say, should we put our clients into this scheme? You know, we're designing a scheme. What do you think of it? Uh, he, he knows all about this. He, he, he was all over. Yeah. Um, there's a... There's a, a, a point that's made from time to time about duplication. So it's terribly wasteful to get other people to duplicate the advice that's been given. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to the, the core documents. But I'm doing this because you know, it, it made sense to come out and talk about the IFAs while, while we were yeah, there. Yeah, sure. So this is one of my contextual points. But I, at the same time tomorrow, so I've now done it. But uh, just to finish off on it, the, the idea that this that independent advice is wasteful and duplicative is just wrong. The whole point about taking independent advice is it might not be duplicative. It might be different. Yeah. And that's value. Well, it seems to have been consistently different. Advice that was taken on this scheme. It no, seems to be no, consistent. Nobody else seems to have given 
the same advice as Mr. Thorne, or taking the same view? Well, the, the, th the material we've just been us. looking at wasn't advice, this was market intelligence. No, all, uh, the advice in this case was all the same, because everybody who took advice in this case, eight of them, they all said, yeah, it works. So it, it, it's not literally the same opinion, but there are, there are you know, one, one solicitor and seven accountants, and every single man jack of them said, yeah, no, that's okay. They, they, this, this, this and is that all in Appendix 2? No, it's only 10. Sorry? Uh, well, it's only 10 in Appendix 2. Yes. Well, Fridge, remember he said to you that there were yesterday. Yes. 110 all. Yours was good, yes. 110, and eight of them took advice. And, but they all, because they're a self selecting group. Yes. Hang on a moment, I'm getting confused now. Are you, is this eight of the 10 or a different mm -hmm. eight? It's eight out of the 100. I think it's 110, eight out of 110. Of took advice. And did any, any of those who gave that advice say there was no doubt that it worked? There was, it, there was no doubt well, about, I don't that, have, about I, that it I worked. don't have all the eight, because one of the evils of the sampling procedure was that I only got to choose five. Right. So and you I, chose five I, I wards, can't say. Did you? Did you, you chose five wards? No, no. You took a spread. No, 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 we didn't. No, there, there, there was a discussion about this at CMC1. We all yep. had to try to be sensible yes, I've seen that. get yep. a spread. And, yep. um, so, so we tried to get a spread. And... Don't worry, it's a... It's a, it's a I mean, I, I, they, they didn't, I don't think anybody used literally the same words, but they all came out and said, you can put your money into this. And of course, when, when you think about it, they are a self-selecting group, because anybody who went to somebody else who said, crikey, you know, this, is a, this one is pretty racy, yes, 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 yes. they, they probably the wouldn't invest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, just going back to duplicative advice, and it being a waste of time, it, the whole point is that it might say something different. And that's because it's looking at something different. Mr. Thornhill is acting for Scots. My lady, Lady Justice Simler, has observed. Scots don't need to have risks explained to them. That's a buyer advice job. So when you are the buyer and you want advice on whether you should go into the deal, you want advice about risk. And the seller and the, is not taking the risks that the buyer is taking. So the seller, or the seller's advisor, may not have thought through the risks to the buyer in the same way as a buyer advisor. That's just basic commerce. It, it's not duplicative. It's independent. And, and let's, at that point, have the judgment in paragraph 141. One for one. It's page one hundred and one. Yeah. Now this is under the heading. So what the judge does is he, he, he sets out his conclusion, gives the supporting reasons. Then he deals with a whole string of arguments being put forward by the claimants at that point, uh, m most of which are still being run, to, to as to why that shouldn't follow, duty shouldn't follow, and he was dealing with them one by one. And this one, you can see the heading about 138, was the one which is, is still echoed by my own friend today, which is Mr. Thornhill was a leading tax specialist and he was giving jolly firm advice. Now, uh, and th this all repays study, uh, because the judge re rejects the, these, th this argument for a series of intellect and good reasons. But the piece I wanted to focus on at the moment was 141 where he says his advice was given in unequivocal terms. It's relevant to breach, but it's no relevance to the reasonableness of investors ignoring the recommendation and warranty in the IM and subscription document agreement as them consulting their own tax advisors. Now, just pausing there, that is obviously right. And what my learning friend has done here is try to get you to put the cart before the horse. Because he says, ah, oh, if you're giving really firm advice, then it follows uh, that any disclaimer in the IM or similar has to be really strong. But you don't get to see the really strong advice until you've read the IM. So you come at the advice through the medium of the IM, which tells you to get your own advice and gives you risk warnings. We'll come back to that on February. 
probably tomorrow morning. But the, the, if you look at his note, his overnight note, or this morning note, if you, if you got that in the detritus somewhere, <laughs> somewhere on the desk, it's a paragraph 2C. Mm. He says, the words, the words that we rely on in, in, in the documents are only relevant for the purpose of determining whether, in the light of those words, it was not reasonable to rely on the opinion. That task can only be undertaken in the context of the relevant words, which would otherwise impose liability on Mr. Thornhill. But that just, as I said, it's chronologically fallacious. You, the first thing you do is read the IM, where it tells you you can have the advice. It doesn't set out the advice, append it, quote it, or anything. Because you can have this, but you've got to get your own advice. So that's the lens through which you then come to see the uh, advice given by Mr. And as the judge says, that, that the fact that he's giving it unequivocally has no relevance to whether you decide to ignore the recommendation of warranty that you, you had to, to go through to get there. And then he says at, at 141, I do not accept in particular the submission that potential investors' own advisors will be led to believe they need not ask for the underlying documents because of the confidence with which he expresses his opinion. An advisor asked by a potential advisor for their advice, as required by the terms of the IM and subscription agreement, could not reasonably advise simply that the scheme would achieve the tax benefits because that was Mr. Thornhill's opinion, however strongly he held it. Now, that's obviously right. Okay. If you do that, you are almost axiomatically negligent. I am going to advise that this must work because the seller's advisor has said it will work. That, that's just not a credible proposition. And as the, the judge says, you, you either do it yourself if you can, and then over the page at the top of 102, he says, if you can't do it yourself, then you tell your client to go elsewhere. And then again, importantly, it was not reasonably foreseeable by Mr. Thornhill that somebody else's advisor, the potential investor's IFA, would fail in their duties. And, and that's a critical finding. Now, it's ten past four. I was going to go back into the IM at that point. That's what I wanted to say about the in independent advisors. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't want to deprive. I, I to take the five, five minutes of my time, but we've travelled quite a long way from the IM. Well, if, if what the, you're really saying is that you, if you're confident <laughs> we're going to finish tomorrow, even if we finish now six minutes early, I'm <laughs> I will make sure that it is safe. And, and I can have my hour. <laughs> yes, now I'm tar targeting 3.15. I'll be there. Yeah. Okay. I think that's fine. I mean, there's no point in going back to that. If we get back into the in information memorandum, by the time we've managed to read it, uh, it'll be ten quarter past four. Exactly. Right, so half past ten tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm.